Laetitia Consoletti, from the University of Nantes. Thank you for sharing this next session. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's a big pleasure to be here having this session in which uh, we will be discussing topics other than the first volume, its predecessors, and its uh, late alternatives or competitors. So it's, it's going to be um, really our two speakers are Madison Forbes and Ben Jones. So Madison is a fifth year English PhD candidate at Fordham University in New York City, where she's writing her dissertation on the classical rhetorical tradition, her text and cultures in 16th century England. She teaches writing and rhetoric courses at Fordham, while also teaching Latin to primary school grades at the high school in Manhattan. Now we'd love to hear more to hear more about this, but for the moment, she will be discussing the first volume's project to predecessors. So it's nice. Yes. So this conference presentation is the coda of my dissertation. So she's been kind of key. Whipped cream on the ice cream cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's been a pleasure to kind of dig into this. But the dissertation on the whole really asks the question of how do we interpret and how do we understand text as readers from a distance from the author? Uh, so this also asks that question. Authors write texts for readers, and those texts teach readers how to be good readers. Writers rely on an arsenal of rhetorical skills to engage readers through a poem, a play, a novel. Whether through the invention of a story, the arrangement of argument, the style of the language, the memory of a speech, or the delivery of a book, authors construct texts for readers to grasp with their minds. Authors build texts with their own rhetorical hermeneutics to captivate and move readers in, through, and out of a text. One technology books use to usher readers in through and out of texts are paratexts, biblic technologies, that escort readers between the outside world and the text. Paratexts negotiate a reader's positionality inside and outside the world of the text, just as Shakespeare's first book is paratexts do. A paratext, as Gerard Genet propounded in his seminal 1987 work, paratext is constituted by a network of elements accompanying the text and is therefore subordinate to it. Paratexts provide a space between the inside world of text and the outside world that discourses about the text, a kind of vestibule, as Borges says about paratexts. In paratext, Jeanette provides a taxonomy of the marginal productions of a book that affects the reader's approach to the text. Jeanette's taxonomy of paratexts includes epitext and paratexts, any material on the periphery of the main text. He focuses on the linguistic apparatuses which create transactions between authors and readers. Paratexts provide, quote, a privileged place of pragmatics and a strategy of an influence on the public, an influence that, whether well or poorly understood and achieved, is at the service of a better reception of the text and a more pertinent reading. Paratexts guide the reader into and out of the book, equipping a reader with an authorial sanctioned structure to navigate the inner workings of the main text. Both Johnson and Shakespeare printed their plays in Porto throughout their career, but in 1616, Johnson printed his works of Ben Johnson in Folio. In the wake of his death, Shakespeare's peers took on the project of doing what Johnson had done for himself, print a complete works of Shakespeare in Folio. In 1623, Hemming and Condell, with the help of, of the actors in The King's Men, published the first folio, Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. The printed folios included paratexts, and with the paratexts furnished their plays as an authoritative book. The paratexts that frame their works, although rely on the paratextual genres of epistles to patrons and general readers, as well as commendatory and dedicatory verses. They function with a stronger emphasis on the author and less on general readers. The paratexts in Johnson and Shakespeare's folios participate in dedicatory rhetoric for patrons and accommodating rhetoric for general readers. 
However, emphasis in Shakespeare's project centered Shakespeare, the author, as an accommodative technology for readers to understand the plays rather than, say, some like chiasmus that might be helpful for a reader to see the difference between the fellow and Johnson's court of publications of his plays in the folio edition of works in 1616 acknowledges experimental dispositions of paratexts. Johnson provokes readers in his paratexts to be us more than just a reader and become an understander. In Epigram 1, Johnson again addresses the reader, pray thee take care, that takest my book in hand, to read it well that is, to understand. To provoke readers even more to take seriously the reading of drama, he relies on the ancient rhetorical teaching to inveigh against an opponent in order to win your audience over. The spectators are those who are, quote, esteemed the more learned and sufficient for this by the many through their excellent vice of judgment and get off wittily with their ignorance. Spectators are the ignorant and conceited, and according to Johnson, those who will not appreciate or understand his play. Johnson creates in his introduction of coterie of ignorant readers, the spectators with whom no reader wants to be associated with. Rather, Johnson invites readers into his coterie of understanders. Who are these understanders? Johnson does not spend much time describing who these are, but they are not the spectators who are easily amused with the concupiscence of dances and antics so vivid. Johnson wants an active, engaged reader. Johnson's mimetic adherences for text and paratext underscores the reality that texts are carriers of relationships. Relationships with other people are based in nature and art. For Johnson, this reflects the natural bond, textual coterie. Johnson, too, build textual, builds textual coteries around himself with other texts which he had not written, namely Shakespeare's first folio, for whom he named the soul of the age. It was not for seven more years after Shakespeare's death that the first folio was published by Henry McConnell. In the three decades before, 95 quarto editions of Shakespeare's works were published, followed not closely behind by Thomas Decker with 56 quartos in print, Middleton with 43, and Johnson with only 24. Shakespeare, even before the first folio, was the greatest favorite of his time. In the wake of his death, Shakespeare's peers took on the project of doing what Johnson had done for himself, print the complete works. In Henry Fondle's epistle to the great variety of readers, they reveal that Shakespeare was, quote, abused with diverse stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that exposed them. Adopting similar language that Petrarch had when disclosing how he found Quintilian's writings mangled, disparagus, mutilated black hair and dismembered Ephusus Artos. Or again, when Leonardo Bruni tells his friend Poggio that he found Quintilian formerly mutilated black hair and mangled Discarpus, has recovered all his limbs through you. Heming and Condal took these abused, maimed, and deformed limbs of Shakespeare's plays Porto and now cured and perfect their limbs and all the rest absolute in their numbers as Shakespeare conceived them. But they tell the readers that their duty was, quote, only to gather his works and give them to you. While alive in Porto, Shakespeare participated in the now obligatory lip service to patrons through paratext for poetry. For example, the Lucrece was dedicated to Henry of Morphosley, Earl of Southampton, and Baron of Titchfield. In the dedicatory letter, Shakespeare uses the language of flattery, for whose disposition is too worthy to read his untutored lines. Shakespeare binds himself to Morpheus Lee's lordship, to whom he wished long life still lengthened and with all happiness. In addition to the dedicatory letter, Shakespeare also provides readers with an argument as a paratext. The argument attends to the reader's understanding of the historical plot of the poem. In prose, Shakespeare gives a brief chronology of events, spoiling the plot of the poem. The paratexts in this publication reach out to both patrons through the rhetoric of flattery and to readers through the Wikipedia-style synopsis. <laughs> Yet the emphasis from the paratext of the folio remained elsewhere. Reception of the folio is at the heart of each paratext. The reader's province is to read him and to praise him. 
The prior text spend as much time provoking the reader to read as they do exhorting Shakespeare to be memorialized. The provocation begins with the first page of the folio, a 10 line poem to the reader, written by Ben Johnson. Johnson's poem invites folio's readers to look towards the figure on the verso side of the folio, opposite Johnson's poem. Johnson begins his poem, which can scarcely be categorized as a commendatory poem because of its extended apostrophe to the reader, by focusing on the reader's attention on an image, not on a text. But shortly after the first plot change, Johnson invades against the ability of visual art to capture more than what is visible in nature. If this were possible, quote, his face the print would then surpass all that was ever written in brass. Yet the graver, although he, quote, had a strike with nature to outdo the light, end quote, he could not. So Johnson implores, quote, readers look not on his picture, but on his book. Pictures may capture what is visible to the eye, but as Johnson demonstrates, the visible Shakespeare is not what readers want. Readers want the intangible, invisible wit that which can only be captured in Shakespeare's words. Both Johnson's poem to the reader and Henry Connell's epistle to the great variety of readers emphasize the reader's privileges. Readers hold the privileged position to read and censure. Their survival and fate of all books depends upon readers' capacities, quote, from the most able to him that can but spell. Johnson and Shakespeare's stationers recognize the need for a general readership to esteem written works. Even when John Donne admits in the canonization that some legends of lovers, quote, will be fit for verse, and if no piece of chronicle proof, will build in sonnets pretty rooms, and by these hymns all shall approve us canonized for love. Although the speaker is the one who is the architect building the pretty book sonnets, according to Dunn's speaker, he still must rely on the all who shall approve, just as Shakespeare's readers must do. The observers, the readers, the patrons hold the power. Memorialization of a poet only occurs when the readership, those with power and ability, can canonize poets. The last decade of Queen Elizabeth's life saw a noticeable decrease in private patronage. While some patrons still funded artists, especially elite wealthy women in court, as new funding opportunities in both public performance and selling books became more readily accessible, poets and printers looked towards more egalitarian methods of patronage, the public. The fate of books depends upon readers' capacities, not only of their, quote, heads alone, but of their purses. Readers can read and censure Shakespeare's folio, but in order to do that, they must buy it first. Reading alone will not canonize Shakespeare and his verses. Rather, Henry and Connell strongly emphasize that, quote, but whatever you do, buy. Censure will not drive a trade or make the jack go. The market Shakespeare is a part of is a part of trade, and readers hold stock in this trade. Henry and Connell envision a reader who is important in the same way as, quote, the most noble and incomparable pair of brethren. Earl of Pembroke and Lord Chamberlain to the King's Most Excellent Majesty and Philip of Earl of Montgomery and Company, gentlemen of His Majesty's Bedchamber, both knights of the most noble order of the Garter and our single good lords. Like these lords, public readers can transform the reading of trifles into, quote, something. Readers hold transformative power. Previously, books either chose his patrons or found them. But the first folio hath done both. The folio chooses whom it dedicates to, but also finds readers from the public who become patrons of Shakespeare. The system of patronage for the arts is beginning to change. The important question then becomes, who is Shakespeare that public and private patrons invest in? Shakespeare was the soul of an age, a monument without a tomb and art alive still by the book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to live. Readers have the diverse capacity to recognize Shakespeare's wit. Henry and Connell encourage their readers to read him, therefore, again. Readers are not reading just a book. They are reading a mind, a person who is a happy imitator of nature, who is the most gentle expressor of it. Shakespeare is a crowned poet first, then poet's king. Readers don't just encounter tragedies, comedies, and histories in the folio. They encounter, quote, what he thought. They encounter Shakespeare, a person readers are to understand. 
person. For this reason, Hemi and Connell provide readers with power texts. Even if readers read him therefore and again and again, they might still be in, quote, some manifest danger not to understand. When readers encounter this difficulty, Hemi and Connell, quote, leave you to other of his friends who, if you need, can be your guides. This line is one of the most explicit in how power texts work in folio. The preparatory material are guides, just as Virgil was to Dante. When readers encounter a difficulty, they should turn to the supplementary material of Shakespeare's friends. These paratexts will illuminate readers' minds on the person of Shakespeare, and in turn give them understanding on the text. However, quote, if you need them not, you can lead yourselves and others, end quote. Paratexts are not necessarily to the reading and understanding of Shakespeare, but auxiliary. The way to understand Shakespeare's writing is through Shakespeare himself, but it is not necessary. The printed paratexts in Shakespeare's first folio, however, are not written or even overseen by Shakespeare, as it was for Johnson. So what might Shakespeare have thought about paratextual media and accommodating the reader's experience of a play? We can get to this question by looking at how Shakespeare uses genre structures and characters to paratextually engage the audience to be as more than just spectators. Examining how authors, editors, and printers understand how paratextual matters operate in print allows us to then examine how paratextual matter on the stage work in different ways. The ancient theories and practices of paratext derive from oral traditions and rhetoric, so it would only follow that these traditions remain in oral performances like drama. Shakespeare stages paratextual performances in his plays, as in Midsummer Night's Dream, Henry IV, Part II, and Henry V, and Midsummer Night's Dream. Shakespeare uses paratextual technologies in his plays to create rhetorical entrances and hermeneutical keys for his audience to understand the play. One entrance that helps audience members understand the play was not an entrance at all, but an exit, a hermeneutical tool to close the play. Shakespeare himself answers that question for his courtly audience in an epilogue likely given at court in a performance of Henry IV Part II where he stepped out on stage admitted, admitting publicly his own fearful preoccupation with his courtly audience's displeasure. But Shakespeare, after the performance for his courtly audience, swerves in his epilogue. Rather than solely accommodate the audience, he announces that this final speech, quote, is of my own making, and what indeed, I should say, will I doubt, prove my own mind. And yet in what follows is an apology to the gentleman and gentlewoman for his late displeasing play. Like the clown at the end of Twelfth Night, Shakespeare will strive to please you every day, even to the point of committing his body to their mercies, kneeling down before them to erase his debts from providing them a play with more false now. In his supplication, Shakespeare beseeches the gentlewoman and gentlemen before it, asking that, quote, if you be not too much employed with fat meat, or humble, our, humble, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it in making merry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of sweat, unless already have been filled with your hard opinions. For old cast died a martyr, and this is not the man. Shakespeare uses the epilogue to usher readers not only out of Henry IV Part II, but into his forthcoming play in Henry V. Shakespeare does not again provide audiences with a documented epilogue or prologue himself in Henry V. However, he adopts the ancient Greek paratextual dramatic device, the chorus. Historically, the Greek chorus was always para, uh, beside, and infra, below, with the stage relegated in the chorus. The chorus was always separate from the main action performed on stage, just like paratexts are relegated to the periphery of things. Whether Aeschylus, Sophocles, or Euripides, all three major Greek tra tragedians considered the chorus an essential component of tragedy for Aristotle. The chorus, however, is not an objective technology like the argument, which relies on historical or uh, thought matters of fact. The chorus is, as Shakespeare says, prologue like, offering meta commentary on each act of play and imposing epilogue. In Henry V, each choral performance impresses upon their audience the ability to use their imaginary forces. The chorus, although a fan of Al, is there to serve the audience, to help them, quote, gently to hear and kindly to judge their play. The chorus are ciphers to this great concoction. 
The hermeneutical import of ciphers remains noteworthy. A cipher was an arithmetical symbol or character zero of no value by itself, but which increases or decreases the value of other figures according to its position. In the same way, choruses add value or decrease value depending on their relationship to the audience. The chorus continually asks the audience to use their faculties of imagination in order to see that the cock that holds the vasty fields of France and cram within this wooden O the very cast that did afright the air of agony. The chorus as a technology for the audience is used to provide directions for the spectators to see and interpret the play so that they may become more spectators and see it as an understanding. Throughout the play, the chorus guides the audience in, through, and out of the historical fiction, just as the epilogue does at the end of the class. Shakespeare uses the chorus to transport the audiences back to the present of, of the little room, the, the wooden bow, in a genre that is itself a little room. With the chorus, what the chorus does not do, however, is transport the audience out of the play and into the present with newfound historical context. Rather, the chorus reminds the audience not of Elizabeth, but of Shakespeare's first tetralogy, the Henry VI and the Henry VI plays in Richard III. The epilogue transfers the audience not back to reality, but into other fiction which Shakespeare created, a vestibule to other vestibules. The audiences re-encounters the rough and all unable end of our bending author, like the folios, the, the folios paratext, Shakespeare's embodied paratext on the stage point towards Shakespeare as the tools for understanding the play. Well, thank you very much, Madison, for drawing our attention to the reader in the Arab text. And as a French person, strong patriotic female, I'm always happy to have a uh, is present in the discussions. So um, thank you very much. I'm sure there were lots of questions at the end. Um, our second speaker is Ben Higgins. He's a literary critic and book historian who teaches early modern literature at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on Shakespeare, book history, and early modern literary culture. His book, Shakespeare's Syndicate, the first volume of its publishers in the early modern book trade, which came out last year with Oxford University Press, revises current histories of both early modern print and Shakespeare's reception. It is shortlisted for the Shakespeare Association of America's first book of works, why we keep our fingers crossed uh, for this award. We will be listening eagerly to his account of alternative collections, Shakespeare in print in Zamel Wunder around 1653. Well, just while that's happening, bonjour, bonjour, merci à toutes et à tous. Je suis très heureux être ici aujourd'hui, mais je, parle, je, euh, je vais parler en anglais parce que je, je parle seulement un peu de français euh, et euh, vraiment, j'ai le français d'enfant. <rire> C'est tout. <rire> Okay, so um, I'm going to switch to English uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying I was so uh, struck by a quote that's in from Lucy's talk that she put up, in which there was a, a long quote that um, gave us a metaphor uh, of a kind of Copernican universe. Um, and at the center of that metaphor, what I took that metaphor to be asking us to think about was the kind of centrality of the first folio um, to the sort of history of the Shakespearean text. Um, so this, this, this sense that everything revolves around it. Um, and, and really the whole purpose of this talk today, for which I've also been moving between 
various screens. So sorry about the clumsiness there. But the whole the whole purpose of this talk is to try and push at that and maybe unsettle that uh, sort of intuitive sense of our order, which is that the first one is at the middle, uh, and everything else kind of orbits around it. Um, and I also want to confess that there is there is actually less Samelband or Samelband um, collections in this than I wanted. It's sort of work in progress. There are some. There are two, in fact. Um, it's, it's sort of about some other things as well. So, okay, we, we all have some kind of vision of Shakespeare. We think about Shakespeare and it means certain things to us, certain images, certain lines, um, and lots of those uh, lines, images, traces of Shakespeare actually probably include some of the things that we've just heard about then, you know, epithets like the soul of the age, maybe, or uh, circulating around this room and things like the drow shout, as I said, uh, <laughs> a portrait, the, these are the traces that we recognize. And a lot of, for, I think for a lot of us, our basic vision of Shakespeare sort of is the first folio in various ways. Here we are at the 400th anniversary of that book. And as I say, I want to just um, challenge its sovereignty um, as the kind of originary force of our, our sense of Shakespeare. Um, I recognize that sometimes it's a slightly risky idea in that we are here on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of the first folio, but let's see how it goes. So it seems straightforward is to say that the first folio has pretty much since it was published uh, been the central document of the Shakespearean text. After all, it has the most Shakespeare, it's associated with its closest colleagues, it supplies in its preliminary pages the richest suite of biographical material that we have that speaks to the author's life, and the book itself claims this centrality in, in lots of arresting ways, um, perhaps most memorably by dismissing everything that came before it in this famous quote here uh, by John Hemmings and Henry Condell. I won't go through the whole thing, but we probably all know this, we've heard some of it already. It sweeps away these um, stolen and surreptitious copies. Um, so, so that idea uh, that, the, that Hemmings and Condell set out here, which is that the first folio offers us uh, the most Shakespeare and the best Shakespeare, was carried through uh, by Shakespeare's earliest editors. So since the this is Alexander Pope. Since the above mentioned folio edition, wrote Alexander Pope in the preface to his edition of 1725, all the rest have implicitly followed it without having any recourse to any of the former editions. Everything follows the folio in Pope's tasks. Now, in fact, Pope's edition, those of you who know it in 1725, is quite scathing about the first folio. Um, but Pope is also quite scathing about sort of everything that happened before Pope. So, <laughs> you know, there's not too much to make of that. Edition. But later, Samuel Johnson says something similar in his edition of 1765. Johnson wrote that whoever has any of the folios has all that he needs. Uh, and continues that I collated them all at the beginning of this project, but afterwards I used only the first. So he's relying on that first folio. So the first folio makes this powerful claim for supersession um, in order partly to cast doubt on the many prior Shakespeare editions. And among those editions, some alternative collections or groupings of Shakespeare, which already existed. So the folio's job partly here is to dispel or reject these alternative collections. And most obvious of these, and this is the first reference to a sound number, is that by that collection of plays we've heard about a few times already, which is the 1619 Porto collection. So 10 plays printed in nine editions, um, originally thought to be a group of remainder plays, but in the early part of the 20th century through some thrillingly innovative practices in the new bibliography, uh, reconceived as the Pavia Portos, perhaps more latterly the Jagged Portos. Um, but in fact, the first printed book to gather several texts and to package them as a, as a Shakespeare collection involves not drama, but verse. So it's this book. Uh, this was the lyric miscellany, The Passionate Pilgrim, published by William Jagger in 1599. So the printer who's responsible for the most authoritative collection of Shakespeare's work, this is two, three, sort of last word, if you like, is also responsible for the first word as, as a grouping, a collection, a compendium of Shakespeare in some form. They had very different fates, these two collections. So this well-known collection included 20 poems, and all of these poems were advertised as being by W. Shakespeare on the title page there. Um, of those 20 poems, we now think that perhaps five of them, although that number varies a bit, are actually Shakespearean, whereas the rest of them are by a variety of other authors who do not feature on this type of page, Christopher Marlowe, Walter Raleigh, and various other And there are other printed collections of Shakespeare, 
uh, both before and after the first folio. So there's the sonnets, 1609. Um, there are those 10 partly Shakespearean plays, so today's the Pinky Portos. Uh, later, we've got things like John Benson's reworked poems of 1640. There are other efforts. And there are also surviving reader sample bands from this period that gather bits of Shakespeare and package it with other alternative writers. Um, in general, though, we've had these alternative collections apart from the main tradition of Shakespearean textual history. And that's partly because we've taken Hemings and Condor at their word, which is to say that we've basically thought of them as belonging to that category of somehow stolen or surreptitious or maimed or deformed or corrupted or somehow illegitimate collections. They're seen as trivial or, or, or pirate adventures. Um, and so really they've sort of mostly served to consolidate the centrality of the first folio. Um, we, we look at them and we see them as a way to sort of validate or verify uh, the folio's um, claim um, to, to dismiss these things and be, be the kind of perfect thing. So I want to look at one of these collections in a bit more detail to understand a bit more about that question of the, its legitimacy, and that's um, The Passionate Pilgrim. So as I say, it features 20 poets. Um, this is okay. This is the first half of the book. I did originally do it all, but it just looked ridiculous like a concertina. Uh, so this, is, this is the first half of that book, the first 16 leaves or 32 pages. They're actually only printed on the rectos in this book. So it's, it's sort of accurate. So there isn't anything on the versos of these pages. It's quite padded out in its face. Um, now this book has a really long and complicated textual history, and I'm not going to go through all the nuances of that here. Um, but the main thing I want to focus on is that it wasn't until 1767, somewhere around there, that the scholar Richard Farmer discovered an epistle uh, which cast doubt on the authorship of the book, sort of modern scholars or contemporary scholars. Now, Farmer's discovery of this epistle, a well known epistle, um, which, which claims to ventriloquize Shakespeare's irritation at being uh, named as the author of this collection. Um, his discovery uh, sparked debates about the authorship of the individual poems, and those debates continue today. So there's some consensus, and roughly speaking, we can say that poems one, two, three, five, and 16 are thought of as Shakespearean, usually. Uh, four, six, seven, nine, and 10 might be a bit more tenuous, but might be several of them engaged, for instance, with Venus and Jonas, Shakespearean, well-known Shakespearean story, um, obviously not originally. Uh, poem 8 is by Richard Barnfield, uh, Poem 11 by Bartholomew Griffin, so lots of other writers, and, and these debates continue, some of them are secure, some of them aren't. What this means, as Edmund Malone, the uh, editor of Edmund Malone, wrote in his own copy in 1785, is that the passionate pilgrim had, for near a century and a half, passed for Shakespeare's. So there are two things I want to highlight from this little vignette I've painted here. The first is that it took a shift in scholarly thinking. And in this case, it was a discovery of a new book. I mean, it wasn't a new book, but it was newly discovered, newly discovered by Richard Farmer to transform this collection of poems from being something that was genuine to being something that was problematic and viewed suspiciously. And since Farmer's discovery, the passionate pilgrim has been dismissed as illegitimate and corrupted because basically, to put it simply, it claims that Shakespeare wrote things that he didn't. Uh, and the thing that I want to put out of that to emphasize is that prior to Farmer's discovery, there must have been many readers then who encountered a genuine version of Shakespeare in their reading of this collection. So there's readers who own, and also it's, it's a much cheaper uh, and argue, and it came out in several editions and, and therefore arguably more widely dispersed book, possibly, than the first folio. Um, and what I want to think about here is, is whether it's whether or not it's possible or valid even to think about these alternative Shakespeare's um, as worthy of interpretive significance. Um, and is there a way to sort of recuperate these figures into Shakespearean textual history? So the first folio is the most complete collection of Shakespeare's works that we have. Um, and it claims also to contain the best or most perfect, to use the uh, language of the preliminary answer, versions of Shakespeare's texts. But at the same time, as in this 400th anniversary year, we now have never had a clearer sense that the folio as a collection is flawed in ways that we might productively, if provocatively, compare with some of these earlier alternative collections in order to reinvigorate our thinking about textual status and textual equality. 
So we've always known that the folio is filled with gaps. That's been apparent uh, pretty much from the get-go. We've heard yesterday about, for instance, the fact that it lacks two noble kinsmen, doesn't have Pericles, doesn't have any of the poems. But now, recent developments in scholarly method are establishing an increasing sense that the folio might be, to use Heming Hemings and Condell's language, maimed and deformed in certain ways. And, th and these developments, I think, have the potential to change the status of the first folio in the way that prior collections have undergone this kind of evolution. So over the past 20 years, scholars of editing, of revision, the authorship, working with their own technological advancements, have placed the claims made by the first folio about its perfection and completion under unprecedented scrutiny. We now know that in many cases, the first folio silently removed Shakespeare's collaborators. Again, that's been a big, quite strong theme of this conference. And that its rhetorical insistence, whether those collaborators, by the way, are fellow authors or, in fact, um, uh, members of the theatre company, as we heard earlier, sort of strained kind of peek through the book in various ways, but are also oddly suppressed in other ways. Um, and it, so the first point is rhetorical insistence on the natural sovereignty of, of one individual author is, is just misleading. The same plays in the New Oxford Shakespeare edition. The New Oxford Shakespeare edition feature a much busier set of attributions. There's a couple of examples there, you perhaps can't read them from that distance. Titus Andronicus is by Shakespeare and George Peel, with an added scene by Thomas Middleton. Measure for Measure is by Shakespeare, posthumously adapted by Middleton. There are lots of examples of these. Henry VI is a good one. The first part of Henry VI is by Marlowe, Nash, and Anonymous, later adapted by Shakespeare. Okay. A much busier sense and crowded sense of responsibility. Now, some of the claims made by this edition are tendentious and they're not uniformly accepted, but it would also be very difficult to find a Shakespearean today who rejects the idea of collaboration wholesale. So, we're talking about scale, not category. And just as the first folio filters out all traces of other writers or to think back to the pilgrim, it claims that Shakespeare wrote lines that he didn't. It also now seems likely that some non-folio playbooks elide Shakespeare's presence in turn. So Edward III, for example, left there, um, printed in two quarter editions, 1596-1599, doesn't name any author, now generally thought to include Shakespeare's work. The fourth edition of the Spanish tragedy features editions often now thought to be by Shakespeare, Arden of Faversham, but right there, repositioned as a genuine collaboration by the New Oxford Shakespeare. So in other ways, because of the way that we read early modern drama at this point in time, the version of Shakespeare that's enshrined by the first folio has never looked more vulnerable. So it's under pressure, both from within the volume, as plays that are included are being reconceived as collaborative works, um, and from without the volume, as Shakespeare's presence is discovered in plays that weren't included in the volume. So in some ways, the, the authority of the first folio at this moment uh, is changing, evolving, maybe even dissolving. And the reasons for that have to do with our moment, our particular historical moment. So we read now with the help of a digitized corpus of early modern literature, which lets us read at scale. We can now read early modern literature in kind of vasty ways that were previously impossible. We can also do all kinds of Stylometric nimble analysis, again, previously impossible to prior generations of scholars. And if you think back to the changes to the Passionate Pilgrim, those were changes that were sparked by um, discovery, simply discovering a new title, or rediscovering a new title, farmers' discovery of that thing was uh, Today, that seems less likely. We have much better and sort of finely grained, um, sort of built in sense of textual records, so we have that. But the book history and bibliography, at least, I think the heuristic of discovery is more about looking down, looking at and through the surfaces of the texts that we already have, rather than looking to the sides and find new things. We look down and try and find new things. In the early 20th century, for example, paying attention to watermarks transformed those remainder plays, that Samoban volume, into the paper reports. More recently, Zachary Lesser's work, looking at almost invisible offset ghosts created by ink transfer impressions, rectos to versos, has reinvented those plays again by discovering that they probably also included, did also include Thomas Haynes' play, A Woman Killed with Kindness. So that, 
that collection is being remade once again through very careful attention to its services. Each shift, each revelation, each fresh way of looking and reading at different historical moments transforms the status of Shakespeare. So I'm not suggesting that all collections of Shakespeare are the same, have a kind of easy equivalency that means we can travel between them without friction or problems. They're clearly different. So there are important differences between these marginalized collections and the first folio. So for one thing, both the Crash of Pilgrim and the 1619 Sample Bank collection include texts that involve no Shakespeare at all. So some individual pieces that involve no Shakespeare at all. As far as we know, that tactic never occurs in the first folio. But I do want to suggest that some of our reasons for not being interested in these alternatives, not being as interested, or having it cast away, allowing a cloud of suspicion to linger over these alternative collections, are starting to look increasingly thin. After all, if we're willing to reframe the object of study in each case, not as a series of individual texts, but as a single collection, so one group, which is after all how these ventures market themselves, then we arrive at a similar conclusion. This is reductive, but you could say both the Passion of the Pilgrim and the 1619 collection and also the Shakespeare folio claim that Shakespeare wrote things that he didn't. So the first folio does the same thing. One major difference between them, though, is that the deceptions, if you want to call them that, of the earlier ventures have been visible and known to us for some time. And we've developed stories that organize the responsibility and blame for those projects elsewhere. Most commonly for those two ventures, the station of William Jacket. He becomes the full guy for seeking to profit from Shakespeare's name. But the omissions and the elisions of the first folio are only now really coming into focus, into a sharp focus. And in some ways they're more threatening because they seem to implicate a much larger cast of characters. We can't so easily put them at Jagger's doorstep, partly because of the involvement of the King's Men, for instance. Perhaps even these uh, omissions and elisions may maybe even belong to the creative process itself. So what I mean by that is perhaps that the way you think about the creative act of learning what writing, who's responsible for it, who gets the credit, when the name becomes relevant, is perhaps misconceived, it may, may be starting to change. So the passion of Pilgrim, oh, just a sec, is clearly not going to supplant the first folio as the central document in the history of the Shakespearean text, it's not going to do that. But my point, my point in this talk is that it's partly to the first folio and to that preliminary matter that we owe the idea that this history needs a center at all, which is to say that textual authority should be conceived of as hierarchical and exclusionary rather than distributed and complementary. I have endeavored, wrote Nicholas Rowe in the first edited collection of Shakespeare's writings, a collection he modeled on the first folio, to compare the several editions and to give the true reading. Must any one version of the play be true, perfect, and if not, must the alternatives be stolen, somehow invalid. So I want to finish with my second sample band. This is another alternative Shakespeare from the sample band binding. This is a reader assembled volume. So sample bands, as we all know, are books where readers bought several titles and packaged them in a single one. This is a small one that's now in the library of Corpus Christi College in Oxford. It's probably made in the 1630s, shortly after the first folio. It contains just two poems. Shakespeare's The Rape of Lucrece, and an older poem from 1584, about the same length by Dubatas originally, but to Dubatas, so it was translated into English, uh, the history of Judith, which retells the biblical story of Judith who cut off the head of the tyrant Holofernes in order to save the city. Now, among the many fascinating aspects of this pair, this pair and this volume, which pairs two poems, I want to pick out two things to finish. So one is that in gathering Lucrece, Shakespeare's Lucrece, with the older poem, we get a bespoke version of Shakespeare, is involved in a tightly focused example and counterexample of female agency. Broadly speaking, this is a book which details how a sexual attack on a married woman famed for her chastity, chastity that's the priest, leads to a death that sparks regime change, and then follows that story with another in which a failed sexual attack on another famously chaste woman, that's Judith, leads to a death with larger political consequences as Judith. Um, in some senses, rises up to avenge the increase within this volume, cutting off the head of her attacker. So this is a volume that, in its alternative dynamics of violent restitution, can be read as a kind of boutique publication that repurposes Shakespeare's work as a complementary account of female agency. And the final thing I want to pick up on is that in this finding, the leaves of Shakespeare's poem are out of sequence. Tarquin, in this 
poem seems to rate increase twice. <laughs> so after he first leaves her chamber, like a thievish dog who creeps sadly thence having assaulted her, you turn the page and you get this, and he returns into the chamber. It's been, it's missequenced in this binding. So moving forward, so this is when Tarquin, in the poem, first enters, in this binding, second enters. He sets his foot upon the light and seizes her again. So moving forwards in these copies, in this copies of the poem, excuse me, involves jumping backwards in narrative time as we get a second assault. This is a volume that was well read. It's annotated throughout, has marks to mark up couplets with sententiae and commonplace. There's no sign amidst that reading that the reader's detected a problem in the final poem. There's no sign of tension. So what are, to we, what are we to make of the Shakespeare who lived in the minds of early readers like this, or who bought a collection of the jagged portals, or who owned one of many Shakespearean salmon movies, and who couldn't afford a copy of the most expensive book of English drama that had ever been published to date? What are we to make of those Shakespeare's? In the history of the Shakespearean text, we've tended to sweep these alternative Shakespeare's into the category of less interesting, less important, also, though, but some of the most exciting work in recent times concentrates not on the first folio, but on earlier and later editions of Shakespeare's work that offer us the promise of alternative conceptions of authorial identity and reinvent what we thought we knew. Perhaps now we're on the brink of this 400th anniversary of a new set of literary histories, something more like that complementary model that I mentioned. Earlier. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for truly for provoking presentation and it's an adjective I don't use very often. And for bringing poetry um, and for bringing poetry into the discussion, giving us a picture of Shakespeare as a transgenre author in print. So um, that was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Those of you who know me know you shouldn't leave me the mic. So please ask the most question before I do. Um, and I'm sure there are many, so don't be shy and raise your hands. You, you don't know me, but you, you <laughs> took my word and you will want. So you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you both so much. Yeah, um, thank you both so much for the great, great talks. Um, I had a question kind of first for Max and maybe. maybe. Um, but I'm uh, really interested in paracultural material and commendatory verses. And um, I think it's really interesting about those commendatory verses practicing Shakespeare's poem is that um, they're focusing so much on his death, I wish, you know, he's dead. But it, he, I feel like other commendatory verses, I, I don't see them that often before uh, totally dead. But I wonder um, if that. Uh, I don't know what effect that sort of has on shaping him as an author. And then I wonder then moving kind of from that, if that um if what effect that has on shaping your first folio uh, as the authority. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that question makes sense. Thank you for that. So I think if we compare the commentatory verses to something like Edmund Spencer's commentatory versus to the fairy queen, um the emphasis there is very much on the fairy queen itself, I mean, with uh, Raleigh's mandatory verse, he's very much emphasizing that the fairy queen is not an epic, it is very much a part of tradition. Um, and the emphasis is not on Spencer, but kind of disagreeing with Spencer. So then with the memorialization Shakespeare kind of undergoes with his mandatory verses, I think it contributes to the singularity of how we view Shakespeare, that we're trying to move away from the kind of compendium the collaborative authorship that Shakespeare is so involved in. I mean, drama is such a collaborative effort and that, and then Kondal are now seeing the reading of drama as a singular type of authorship. It is a singular experience for readers um, rather than maybe even with the Commentatory versus with Spencer as a kind of open discussion. It seems that the Commentatory versus for the first will be a very narrowly point readers to a single hermeneutic end, and that end is Shakespeare. 
Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the thing that strikes me from your question, I think, is, uh, you know, it's easy to praise someone when you're dead, I think. And I don't think that has to be different in the modern period. I mean, the folio in one of its preliminary, I think the first epistle by Hemingson Conval laments the fact that Shakespeare wasn't alive to oversee. But I mean, they didn't do this while he was alive. And it, so in some senses, I think, yeah, I, I think death releases certain problems. Because in a way, <laughs> if you're alive, you've just won, haven't you, I suppose, from some things. I don't know if Greg Johnson does this, but yeah, from this perspective. So I don't know. I, I, I just, I'd be really interested to see if there was a kind of correlation between a writer's death and then whether actually that enabled a different mode of celebratory or laudatory commemoration. I suspect it would. And, you know, that's partly perhaps one of the issues with Johnson, maybe, is that he's done it himself, mm -hmm. kind of not waited for himself to die. Or something. <laughs> no, other people, men in the brains. Right. Well, his book. Right. And he wasn't. Yeah. They're not him. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's why I have it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just picking up on that final point, I, I guess Johnson, Johnson gets more praised after his death for that whole volume of Johnson had um, yeah. um, and I guess you yeah. And I guess you then just I mean I, I really love the way that you're bringing together the 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 Shakespeare volumes with the plays and the Shakespeare volumes with the poems and kind of think of those alongside each other as as you know ways of accessing Shakespeare in various Forms. Um, and I think it's a really important move, and I, and I like that that's reflected on the on the slightly more fair way that you work on sonnets and plays kind of jostling against each other. And I think we too often work in, in two kind of separate traps when we work on different plays and poems. But I was almost to ask a question about that, which is I was wondering whether whether it does make a difference that you know the passionate pilgrim the one that's approach folios. Is exclusively drama in terms of um, the Shakespearean context, although obviously it does include problematic texts as well. Um, so yeah, I think my precise question is, is really just a probably horribly simplistic one, which is what difference does it make when dealing with plays or dealing with poems? Yeah, thank you. Um... You know, I you asked that question, and one of the things I thought during your talk was I was really appreciative and grateful to you for collapsing in lots of ways another kind of distinction that I think we keep alive between the page and the stage, which is another one of those binaries that is actually quite difficult to maintain when you look more closely at things. Um, I think this, I think, I suspect that the binary that we've got about Shakespeare as a poet, perhaps in the earlier stages of his career, and then if you like, the kind of main thoroughfare in his life as a working playwright, I suspect that that might partly be down to the first film. And, you know, as you've shown us, it's, also, it's a book that's very circumscribed by its commitment to the theatre. You know, there are various theories that I've come across about why it doesn't include the poems. Colin Burrow in his edition of the poems wonders whether they were simply too popular to secure and get their rights. Um, they were very popular. You know, things like Venus and Adonis have been published many times. So maybe it was just maybe the rights owners held out. Maybe not, because the, I'm often struck by there are two adverts in the Frankfurt book there for the first folio. And in the earliest one, based by Isaac Jagger, he describes it as the plays of William Shakespeare, all in one volume, in folio. So there's some kind of intention of the earliest documentary trace of the folio becoming a thing, that actually its investment in drama is intentionally specific. So I suspect that it's partly to the folio that we owe, in some sense, this division. And it seems to me important to collapse that a bit, or, or poke at it somehow. So yes, you're right. That was why I had this slide and things just for the next one. Thank you. Madison, thank you. Ben, thank you so much, both of you. 
I just wanted to ask you, Maddie, um, uh, I guess you're a classicist. So um, I very much appreciate you having brought up the Greek chorus as a form of paratext. I think this is fascinating. And um, I also, and it's a little bit, you know, it's a side, but the word cipher, of course, um, and decipher. But I mean, here he's using in Henry V, the cipher is, I mean, for you, it's the placeholder, but also the extra zero. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think that's how I read it as well. But I'm, I'm thinking about now cipher and decipher and the Greek chorus. You know, I hadn't thought about that until you brought it up. Do you have any comments? <laughs> um, I think it's Shakespeare trying to play with the audience more than we might imagine that this is just one way to decipher the text is through the Greek chorus. This is one way that we can potentially see how as this English hero who has contributed to the Tudor majesty in one type of sense. But then I think in some ways, they can also, the chorus can also be very misleading. It talks about the swelling um, and that adjective always gets me in something negative. Um, and so I think it, there might be some irony in the cipher and cipher that you might not always get at what he means, nor should you, um, in a sense. So I think he plays with the chorus as a contextual technology, whether it can be an aid to understanding or potentially an obstacle to understanding, which can make it more fun. It, just to follow up on that and ask you again, in Aeschylus and Sophocles and the Greek traditions, I mean, basically, um, is the chorus does have a point of view and it depends on, yeah. So what you're saying is that this point of view, depending on what who what characters the, the courses are made of, gives us a point of view. Yes. And I you're saying that that's being brought into Henry V. I think primarily the nice. Greek tragedy, the chorus is very much on the moral side of the story. There are, I think, once you get to Seneca, he plays with that a lot um, in the Roman tradition. But I think for the Greek tradition, because of the religious elements of drama. There is a kind of emphasis on morality on for where the audience, the course interprets the kind of composition. But I think once you get to the Roman tradition and then especially about Shakespeare, the courts can be very ambiguous in what they're trying to get across. Thank you. I just had a remark, sorry about the um, chorus. Um, the prologue in Henry V was not in the quarto versions, was it? And I'm asking you, no, no, it wasn't. So if it's for the readers, I think that changes things. But I mean, I mentioned it because I think it needs to be taken into account to. Um, Associated expansion. Uh, now we do have some time to make a comment. Sorry, I'm going to me. Thank you very much. Um, ben, can we come up to, to, to summarize a bit uh, here? Um, thank you so much for showing us those two examples. And, um, I still don't quite know what I'm going to call the kill that's doing in the 1619 collection. It's got a the title pitch, hasn't it, kind of um, in there? Yeah, what, what it's doing there, I don't quite know. Um, but but um, quite a lot of the later 17th century soundbites seem to be um, antiquarian to some extent in, the, in, in kind of what they're doing. These people are looking backwards, um, they're not quite called old plays yet, but that kind of later sense of is there. Um, is that once the Lucre's edition, um, and do you see this by the 1630s as in some way? Memorializing for kind of almost antiquarian, or is it still seeing it as kind of contemporary poetry? Yeah, thank you really very much. Um, I yeah, I really agree. Most, most certainly, most of the sound plans that I've used are late, are late, and um, or if they exist at all, because the other phase is that they get crumbled and individuated, and 
you know, there's this whole kind of swathe of reading culture that's been revitalized recently by you know, people like Jeffrey Victor Knight's brilliant book on sample bands and how to read them. There's this whole kind of chunk of reading culture that's been lost and um, as, as, as these books have been broken apart. Um, the, the specifically with the increased ones of the edition is 1632, and there are suggestions in the binding that the binding is not long after that. Um, and uh, is it an antiquarian poem? I don't think so. Um, partly because of the style of the binding and a couple of notes from the stationer, I think, certainly inside the volume, which do suggest it's not long after the, um, that edition. Um, but it is packaged with a poem from sort of 50 years earlier. That's actually pretty unusual with Samuel Vance. The ones that do survive from the early 1600s, the Shakespeare ones that I've seen, more often uh, look as though they're a marriage of interest and convenience in the sense that they might be three or four or five things that are within a few years of each. Maybe you bought them at the same time as that suggestion. It's a kind of temporal proximity. And there isn't with this one, there's a really interesting gulf which seems to me further to support an idea you could read it as a kind of intentional pairing of things that are thematically uh, resonant. Um, so I don't think it's so much about this being an old poem. I think it's more about its themes, about basically female agency and rage and power and assault and those kinds of things. Um, well, the question is. Thank you very much for two fascinating questions. Any questions for that? Um, as uh, your ways of bringing together uh, those connections to the Zamal band are quite incredibly suggestive and useful to think about them, but they're really not the same, though, are they? And as you say yourself, you can break up a Zamal band into pieces and lose some of the parts, but you can't really break up a collection that's assembled as a collection. It's not really the same in the same medium, is it? So I'm just wondering. Well, could really compare them. A few things there. I mean, one quick thing to say is to me, folios were broken apart. You know, that was something. So, you know, that certainly as, as the value of the books became greater, definitely folio plays were kind of crumbled and, and sold off individually. So, you know, you could do that. But I mean, I suppose really there I'm thinking about disaggregation, where you're actually more interested in that, the aggregating of them, the kind of bringing of them together. Um, I, I suppose one difference maybe I'd pull out, perhaps this is interesting, <laughs> um, might be who's the person who's responsible for the gathering. So I think if I'm, if I'm following you right, the thing in which you're interested there is that the summer band is usually, we think, the, the reader, the customer. So it's one person who's contingently gathered and brought these things together. And sort of what's interesting about an edition maybe, thought, is that it's someone else. It's a publisher who's designed and curated a thing in a run of 750 and one thing I'm interested in there is how valid is that as a criteria of dismissal? Over here, we have maybe 750 designed by a cohort of people. There's a footprint there. There's a community behind it. And somehow that seems like it has a greater sense of import. Over here, there's one slender reader who bought a few things and gathered them and looked at them maybe assiduously, maybe not. And I'm just interested in that. So the rationale then is something like the size of the community who participates in the reading. Lots of people, one person. Maybe that's valid, maybe it's not. I don't know, but I'm interested in them. Thank you. Well, before we continue, there was fascinating conversations for a coffee or tea because there's a short break coming up. Please join me in thanking our two panelists.